So to be able to raise my kids in an environment where they won't have to have a part-time job to go see their friends, they have transit all around us, they have bike infrastructure all around us, and we have the density support to support walkability so that they can, like, if we don't have an ingredient, I can send them down to the co-op, not yet, but in a couple of years, I can send them walking by themselves down to the co-op to grab whatever we need for dinner. And that just is an incredible quality of life gift. And I share about that a lot. One morning I was actually out for a walk after I dropped my own kids off. And I started taking photos of all the cargo bikes that I saw. And then I realized that I just was live tweeting cargo bikes. And I got to like 12 different cargo bikes that I'd seen and kids on their own bikes. and I. It's just incredible to see. And there are groups of like 12 to 16 year olds that I'll see in little herds, you know, biking together with their friends. And it's, that's what we should all want for our kids is to have that ability, obviously age appropriate and all the things, but if the infrastructure supports it and the parents and the kids decide that it feels safe, like that's what we should all want for our communities and our families. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Laura Mitchell from Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're going to be talking about her advocacy work out on social media as well as on the streets right there in Minneapolis. So let's get right to it with Laura. Laura, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Laura, I love giving my guests just an opportunity to introduce themselves. So what's the elevator pitch as to who Laura is? So I'm Laura Mitchell. I'm a parent of two young kids who are eight and five now. I'm a former public school teacher, now a nonprofit employee, and an active transportation advocate. I grew up in the suburbs of the Twin Cities, spent 10 years in Denver after college, and then my wife and I moved our family back here to Minneapolis. I love it. I love it. Wow. So, so Denver and Minneapolis, two extraordinary cities uh, for active mobility, and both are getting better year over year. Uh, very exciting. Uh, when did you make that move um, from, from Denver to Minneapolis? Summer of 2019. So we were very okay. lucky to move closer to my family and right. in a slightly larger home before the pandemic hit. So that's yeah. a good time. And of course, you didn't know <laughs> the pandemic was about to hit. No. Boom, no it happens. And you're you're like, okay, well, at least we're near family now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. For so sure. uh, you and I have never met. Uh, this is our first time, you know, uh, quote unquote, face to face. But we know each other through uh, social media. And I'm going to pull up your, your, your threads page here real quick. And uh, we'll zoom in on this just a little bit so we can get a better view of it. Um, and, and I love this. I love the opportunity to like connect with people who I'm interacting with constantly on social media. And, uh, and originally it was out on, on, on Twitter before it became X. And then I made the move over to threads and thank you so much for making the move as well over, over to threads and cross posting, uh, to multiple platforms. Talk a little bit about, you know, in your intro, you, you basically introduced yourself as, as a mom first and, you know, and, and somebody who's doing some work in, in the nonprofit world. But what I really kind of know about you is you're always posting really cool stuff on the interwebs. Talk a little bit about that. Why are you compelled to share so many of these images? And this is just a classic Laura Mitchell inter, uh, uh, post, by the way is just oftentimes they're beautiful and uplifting and inspiring. Why do that? Why are you doing this, Laura? <laughs> it was not the plan at all. Um, I, When I was in college, actually, I was a journalism major and I wanted to go into journalism and be a writer. I was interested in photography, but I graduated during the Great Recession and that was a scary time to try to go into journalism. So I pivoted and became a teacher. And then through, you know, my career has taken all sorts of different paths, but my personal life, I found that I can find so much purpose and meaning in continuing to like capture photos and tell stories. I didn't think anyone would care about stories of like my bike rides, good and bad and everything in between. But as I started to share just photos of my life, videos of things I was encountering, things I was noticing on uh, bike rides and walks, I realized there was there were people who cared about that, people who were experiencing the same and wanted to talk with others who were experiencing the same, people who had no concept of like a life that would support people being able to walk and bike for transportation. And so I just started to share some photos and people started reacting and I shared more. And now I 
I'm so lucky to have just such a community of, of folks that I get to talk to about things I care about. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm going to keep it sort of topical here too, uh, for, for the, the, the time being, uh, in the sense that, uh, yesterday you, you, you posted these, this beautiful post, I think of, um, this walk to school and give the background on this, on this message. I'll bring the, the, the text into focus here so folks can also read it, but this is, this is really kind of cool and kind of fun. Uh, talk a little bit about you know, the story behind this post. Yeah, again, it's just like the mundane day-to-day stuff that I'm like, oh, maybe this actually is interesting. And so every morning before school, we talk with our kids about, do we want, do they want, do they want to walk? Do they want to take their scooters or do we want to bike as a family to school? And my eight-year-old specifically said out loud, I don't want a bike because it's too short, which was shocking to me because they love riding their bike. Both my kids love riding their bikes. And they explained it as they wanted to have more time together, more time outside, more time moving their body. And I just thought that concept of wanting the trip to take longer and choosing the mode that would take longer is in many ways a really bizarre concept for a lot of Americans for so many reasons that we just have to like go, 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 rush to the next thing, oftentimes use cars because they often are the fastest way to get wherever we want to go because of the way that we've built and rebuilt our cities and towns. And so even just that concept of my kid being like, no, I want the trip to be slower. (laughs) And there was a photo to go with it. And I think this is a, and you mentioned that, that this is very much a part of an American sort of cultural thing is that we we're, we're like always in such a hurry. And even, and this is one of the, the pet peeves that I have, like with Google maps route selection for bikes is it always defaults, you know, pretty much to the quote unquote fastest route between A and B. It doesn't really give you the option to uh, filter in and say, well, no, I'm with my kids. I, I'd like to have the most comfortable and safe route or I'm not in a hurry. I'd like to see the most joyous, joyous and beautiful route, <laughs> you know, and it, it's that psyche is weird that we're so hardwired that it's all like, go, go, go. Let's got to get there as fast as possible. Yeah. And in the case of cars, it usually doesn't make a difference whether you take the slow route or the longer route because you have the same relative safety no matter what. But obviously for walking and biking, that can make a huge difference. And so I actually have found I, I ran into that moving to Minneapolis, which while I grew up in the suburbs of Minneapolis, I didn't know Minneapolis proper that well. And so I had to relearn how to get places because I knew Denver really well, but I didn't know Minneapolis. And I found this app called Points with a Z at the end yeah. that does exactly what you say. And so you can you can put in it, I am flexible about how I get there or I want the safest and most comfortable route and it'll give you all the various options and prioritize the separated protected routes um, if, you, if you choose that, which has been so helpful for my family. Well, thank you very much for interacting with Points and, and, and using their, their platform. Um, I've actually been an advisor uh, to them since their, their launch and their startup. And, and so they would send me you know, like beta versions, the early, early stages. And I would try to use the, the, that, the app, uh, to, to route from my home to the downtown area and it would default and put me out on the strode. And I'd say, no, 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 your, your, your algorithm is, is just defaulting. It's thinking like a car. And so it's wonderful to hear that that is continuing to improve. Um, I actually need to get them on the pod so that we can uh, profile where they're at currently with it. Um, how, how is it working with them? Or do, do you feel like it's it's making progress? And I know there's a, a function to this where you as a user can also put information and provide uh, qualitative feedback uh, about routes. Yeah, I think it's working beautifully. And I think part of why it's working beautifully is if I understand correctly, they use um, a specific open source mapping like source in addition to the things that folks can add to within the app itself. And we have a couple of folks in Minneapolis who have done an incredible job keeping all of our infrastructure very well mapped. And so it's a really accurate system that they're pulling from to, to use points on. And so I find it much more reliable than any of the other apps. And I've been loving it. Granted, I haven't had to use it yet and fingers crossed I never will have to, but they also have the roadside assistance now through points. And so if one of my cargo bikes, for example, 
I needed support and needed help getting home, I could call the number and, and get picked up and towed back to my house, which would be incredible. I, I really appreciate you uh, sharing that information about points. And yeah, I'm going to have to get them on. Definitely. That'll be fun. Uh, now, I, I want to share this image that you shared with me because all the time that I have spent in Minneapolis, and it's a fair amount, I've been up there uh, a couple of times and and have uh, uh, profiled uh, things like the open streets programs and stuff like that. And so when I think of my time in Minneapolis, I think of stuff like this. <laughs> it's just, to me, it's like there's so much, there's, it's such a vibrant, joyous sort of environment when you look at the streets advocacy world there and and the types of programs that are going on and the open streets and this looks like it must be uh, like some form of like community ride or something like that um talk a little bit more about that zeitgeist yeah this is a perfect image. So this image is not mine. It came from um, a, a local organization here called Move Minnesota who hosted this ride. And so the person in the yellow that you see there is on a trailer being hauled behind an electric cargo bike. And they're a DJ playing live music that we all can hear. And then of course you see the bubbles. And the impetus for this ride was this street is Lindale, which is up for reconstruction right now. It is a very high density, lots of um, businesses and housing all around it. And it gets a lot of car traffic and is not safe for people walking and biking currently. There's no bike infrastructure on Lindale. Um, and so now that it's up for reconstruction, there's a lot of interest in thinking about how we can make this street safer for all modes, which is going to require taking probably some parking out, maybe taking out a lane, you know, making more space for people who are traveling outside of cars. And so one of the ways that I, I love in Minneapolis, we push for change is by getting together and having fun. And so to help raise awareness about this project, a lot of us got together for this beautiful bike ride, had music, had bubbles, had fun, and we rode on a street that I, in normal circumstances, would not ride my bike on because it's not safe. And there we are having fun. Yeah, yeah. Another memory uh, that's popping into my head about riding in Minneapolis is, and this was years ago, and I don't even know if this, this particular bike lane exists anymore, but it was a bus and bike lane combination. And it just made absolutely no sense to me. It felt like it was one of these, uh, you know, wide strodes, maybe sort of like this particular street that really needed to just be redone. But I kept playing Frogger with this bus and it was just, it was almost hilarious and comical in the sense that, um, you know, I'm rolling down the road. I, I think I must have had I must have had a downhill or whatever because I kept, you know, easily passing the bus and then the bus would have easily pass me and then stop ahead of me and I'd roll around it and et cetera. And I'm just like, what the heck is going on here? It just didn't make sense to me that this was kind of the way that it was set up, that it was a bus and bike lane combination. But what ended up happening is my, my brain sort of clicked in and I'm like, you know what? This is an older city. This is all a grid you know, here. And so I went, you know, I, I turned right at the next intersection, went to the street that was parallel to it and found myself on an absolutely delightful uh, residential street that had an amazing tree canopy and, and, and was a much more comfortable environment. Zero uh, in terms of bike infrastructure, you know, there was nothing there. There was really no traffic calming to speak of. It was just a quiet residential street. And it's one of the things that I mentioned when I when I gave some advice to the points uh, folks when they were working on their app is don't just rely on what a city gives you in terms of what their bike network is, because oftentimes the most comfortable streets that are out there uh, could be these quiet, low volume, low speed residential streets, which, you know, with a little bit of tweaking, like you know, the way Denver's doing now and many other cities are doing now, uh, putting in traffic calming and traffic diverters uh, to create it into an even more welcoming environment for walking and biking. Um, that can oftentimes be a much more comfortable route than on these more major streets. Uh, so that was another kind of like image that just flooded into my brain was playing Frogger with the, the, the buses and, and then, you know, getting off into a, another just cherished memory of those quiet residential streets that are tree canopy. Yeah. 
and and that's been my experience too. I I don't ride on bus bike lanes very often, but I have played Frogger on Nicolette Mall with buses and it's just not fun. And like the reality is there's not, there's no one size fits all best street, you know, set up because everyone has different preferences. It's constantly a situation here in Minneapolis within the bike community of, you know, some folks want to maximize speed on their bike because they're, they're either just really fast and want to ride quickly to get to their destination or they're doing it for exercise. And then there's like me and my family others on the other side where I'm riding with young children and I don't care how fast I am going. I just want to be as far away from cars as possible. And so it's nice to it's nice to be in a situation where I have access to things like points and I have knowledge of the city now to be able to make the choices that work best for me and my trip in the situation. Yeah. And since I'm going down memory lane here on my time in Minneapolis, uh, I have to go to this image here. (laughs) Talk a little bit about this fantastic uh, 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 photograph here and and, and describe it for our listening only audience too. So this is the Midtown Greenway and this is a perfectly average scene on the Midtown Greenway. Uh, So the Midtown Greenway was previously a train route and is not used by trains anymore. And so far before my time, I don't even remember the exact year, like 2007 or something, the land was repurposed to be a mixed use trail. So the the side that you see there is only for bikes. And then the trail on the left hand side is for pedestrians. And something that I've uh, learned to appreciate as I've traveled to other cities is how wide the right of way is here for bikes and pedestrians that were not all squished into just this tiny little space and trying to navigate large crowds. And so the Midtown Greenway is just, and you can see it's obviously grade separated. And so the car, there is car traffic up above on the bridges and on adjacent streets, but there's no cars on the actual Greenway itself. And you're, you're still within like pretty high density areas and it's quite pretty easy to get off of the Greenway and access destinations or to just ride the entire, I think it's about five and a half mile stretch for exercise or to connect into the lakes on the west side of the city and you see folks of all ages and abilities using it obviously in this photo that's my wife ahead of me with our eight-year-old and then another parent with i don't know if it was a kid or a dog in minneapolis it's 50 50 it might be a kid or a dog in a burley when you pass and then folks on recumbents and the person in the background i think was was more, more speedy on a road bike and it's just it's just a wonderful place and what I love about the Midtown Greenway, too, is it's one of uh, North America's best examples of, of you know, creating, repurposing these rights of way, the, an old, uh, you know, railroad right of way that was, you know, decrepit and abandoned, and then repurposing it into a multifunctional, multipurpose, active mobility corridor. And you, you mentioned it there with good connectivity to all the other neighborhoods that it's passing through. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize here in this photo is what we see off to the right there is we also see that, you know, we've, we've, we have people who are, are like loving it too. It's like they're, they're, it's, there's articulation to the buildings there. They've got some flower pots set out there. They've got the ability to interact with. It's, it's what I call the other TOD. Of course, the original TOD is transit-oriented development, and this is trail-oriented development, where people are living and having uh, creative little offices and uh, creative spaces because many of these are old sort of factory locations because it was a longer rail corridor. Um, And so a lot of these spaces, you know, old lofts that have been turned into condos and apartments, as well as, uh, you know, affordable places for creatives to like have a studio or a little business. Uh, And as I recall, there's some really cool little shops and even like cafes that you can stop at uh, along the way through this, uh, this greenway. So I just wanted to point that out that, you know, great shot here because it also captures that articulation and interaction in integration with the side residences and businesses. Yeah, and we do have a bike shop and coffee shop combined venture. Bike shop is on the Greenway, which is incredible. And it's just such a gathering place for community. Like I have so many fond memories, there just was one a couple weeks ago, of 
for folks who organize group rides, the Greenway is often part of the group ride because it's so nice and wide and safe and protected from cars. And so frequently, if you're in a group ride, you will find yourself crossing paths with another large group ride going the opposite direction. People give high fives, ring our bells, wave at each other. Even when it's like, one of my favorite ones was I was on a group ride that was filled with families with young children and we passed a group ride of very speedy cyclists in their kits on their road bikes. And it was the same thing, people giving high fives, cheering each other on. And I don't know, you just don't have experiences like that when you travel in your car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How dare you have fun? My gosh, what are you doing? <laughs> But again, this should be serious. <laughs> yep. Well, and speaking of fun on the Greenway, actually last weekend, there was the nonprofit that um, sort of helps to advocate for the Greenway called the Midtown Greenway Coalition held an event called the Greenway Glow, which is an at night event where people put lights on their bikes and have speakers and there's musical performances and crafts and activities. There was a uh, glow in the dark water balloon catapult that was launching glow in the dark water balloons down the greenway. And it's just, it was just so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously that's, that's a big part. I mean, I, when I look back to the many years that I've been traveling back and forth to, to Minneapolis, the Midtown Greenway was in my mind, one of the key, it was like the backbone of like really what started establishing Minneapolis as a, a much more activity, active mobility friendly community. I don't even want to call it bike friendly community. I mean, it's like it's uh, many of these images, as we'll see as we go through them. It's not about bikes. It's not about that sporty or recreational cyclist. It's about mobility. And but the other thing that kind of harkens back to the image that we saw on your 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 the the very first image that we had here let's let's pull this up again uh this very first image that we have here is the other thing that i remember and really appreciated about minneapolis is uh the midtown greenway and the orientation to the water and all of the opportunities for active mobility walking and cycling around the various lakes because there's an integration of a whole chain of lakes throughout the whole Minneapolis area. And yes, they're recreational and they're utilitarian both. And sometimes they're crowded, but I just found that it to be just a powerful, powerful, beloved set of activity assets that the city had access to. And I've had the opportunity to visit uh, Minneapolis both in the summertime and in the wintertime. So I've actually uh, ridden on the, these you know, pathways during the snow, snowy winter season too. And if it's really, really snowy, obviously, then and, and cold, then it gets kind of repurposed in different ways. But talk a little bit about that, because I think that's one of the neat things is you've you've got those two things, which I think then starts to set up what we're going to talk about next, which is the on street transformation of space away from the automobile. But that I mean, that's my take on it. You've been there a little longer, obviously, since 2019. Uh, that's kind of my take is that it was the Midtown Greenway and then it was this network of pathways, off street network of pathways that connected the lakes um, and then really shifting gears and looking at um, the on street facilities and trying to make that safer and more attractive and, and more inviting. Yeah, I actually just had someone reach out to me saying that they are trying to plan a visit to Minneapolis and wanted to know about the like what makes Minneapolis most innovative and what are the most innovative on street bikeways that we've built. And I actually pushed back and said, I don't think that we're doing anything particularly innovative. I think what sets us apart is what you named, that we have this history from the late 1800s, early 1900s of setting our lakes as public property and public space and then building the paths around them and maintaining them through the centuries, despite, you know, the pressure to build parkways, which we do have parkways for cars around the lakes, but those are separated still from the pedestrian and bike paths. And so having, I think it's, it's something around a hundred miles of off street bike paths that we have like around the lakes and, and the greenway and Minnehaha trail and those sorts of things that we've had for over a hundred years and now have been starting to connect things like the Greenway and our street grid to that to make a really connected system for people to be able to get around, again, either recreationally or 
um, for transportation or both. Yeah. And so let's let's get to that point. Let's let's get to the 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 big challenge of North America is obviously trying to address and um, and and do something to create a much more welcoming all ages and abilities environment out on our streets. And so this is pretty extraordinary. Walk us through this scenario, this scene, and why you felt so compelled to have to share this with the audience here today. Uh, I am the biggest fan of this street that exists. <laughs> I, this is Bryant Avenue South in Minneapolis. It is very close to my home, and I am so lucky to be able to bike on this. So in the photo is my kiddo, my eight-year-old in front of me, and then maybe, a, I don't know, a 12 or 13-year-old. And you can see here that they are riding on a separated, so it's sidewalk level bikeway, two-way bikeway. And then to the left, there's a little bit of um, textured separation, separation and then a sidewalk. And this street previously, it's about a two and a half mile stretch. Previously, it was the most basic two-way street with parking on both sides. And I would say that actually our approach here was a little bit innovative in the sense that we actually had the political will to take more space away from cars to create this because we transformed it. This photo is in the one two block stretch where there is a second uh, lane just for buses. But the majority of the street is actually just a one way street for cars, It's one lane, one way with parking on one side from a previously two lane, two way with parking on both sides. So we great, we essentially took away half of the space that cars had and repurposed it for people walking, biking and rolling. And the building up to the left there is actually a senior living facility. And they have a lot of like medical care in addition to just like 55 plus living. And so there's a ton of ambulances and like supports for, for folks who live there. A number of them are in motorized wheelchairs or otherwise using mobility devices and seeing the way that they are able to walk or roll right out of their apartment and their living situation and enjoy the sidewalk or in the winter, this is another fight that we're trying to fight. The city is really good actually about plowing our protected bikeways, including Bryant, but not about, the city doesn't clear our sidewalks. It's just up to property owners as it is in a lot of the US. And so oftentimes folks will be doing just what you see in this photo where there's ice patches and oftentimes the sidewalks look way worse than they do in this photo. And so folks are able to use the bike paths to walk and roll and it's just incredible to see. Yeah. And I want to switch over, uh, skip this this photo here. It's a beautiful photo, but we're going to skip this because I think this photo here really exemplifies also what you're talking about here is that, and, and this is something that many people do not appreciate about what a cycling, an all ages and ability cycling network can provide for a city is it gives mobility options for people who are in mobility devices. And so this this particular photo is extraordinary. I mean, we've you literally have three people on wheelchair type mobility devices uh, rolling down this two way cycle track that's protected with concrete. What a great shot and what a great way to really say, you know, this is what we mean by all ages and abilities. This is not cycling infrastructure for, you know, people who are confident taking the lane, you know, sport and recreation cyclists can certainly use this space if they ch so choose. But the reason why we're building this type of infrastructure is because it's all ages and all abilities, an emphasis here on all abilities. Yeah. And I mean, look at the two folks in the front actually being able to go side by side. Like exactly. We have decent sidewalks in Minneapolis, but almost no sidewalks would allow two motorized wheelchairs to go side by side. And then they're able to have a conversation just like so many of us enjoy doing on our bikes. And it's just, I feel so grateful to live in a city that has the space set aside for people to safely move in whatever way they need to move. It's yeah, it's such a privilege. And so we see, especially on the new Bryant bikeway that you were showing in the other photo, because that trail is so nice and smooth and new and not bumpy, we see folks on one wheels, on skateboards, on rollerblades, on roller skates, on scooters, like every possible mode that you can imagine that's not like a car or motorized, you'll end up seeing on those bike paths. And it's, it's just a welcoming space for everyone. Yeah. I want to pull this shot up here, too, because this is a, a, a wonderful uh, shot that also shows a two-way cycle track that is 
uh, elevated from the roadbed. So we've got a, a raised and separated uh, cycle track and then uh, a little bit of a buffer uh, to where the, the sidewalk is. But this is in a more residential context. We've got the single family homes, you know, off to the right. Uh, since I know that these are older neighborhoods, I wouldn't be shocked if there was a corner store or a corner cafe at the end of a block on and on many of these places because they were uh, these neighborhoods were really developed prior to exclusive exclusionary single family zoning that you know made having neighborhood shops and and cafes illegal which is one of the things that's so great about all our older cities like Minneapolis is that you have that kind of stuff but talk about this infrastructure this again is just so empowering when you see the number of people out and the number of families that are out rolling down this piece of infrastructure, which is extraordinary. Yeah, so this one is also Bryant, but it is January 31st, 2024, which is very strange that like middle of January in Minneapolis, here we are out riding, there's no snow and ice on the road. But this, this was actually a group ride that I hosted for a PTO fundraiser for my kids' school. And it was incredible that we were able to get a number of families to come together to ride bikes to a restaurant that was about three miles away from the school. At, we met up and left at like 5.30 in the evening in January, and obviously the sun sets very early. So here we were headed to the restaurant. Our youngest rider was three years old on a strider that had pedals, and our oldest rider, I don't know, it's just parents. But we had a ton of like six to eight-year-old riders as well who were able to, to make this route all together. And then on the way home, we were riding in the dark. And like, how often do you see families able to let their young children ride their bikes in the dark? Almost never, because it's usually not safe because of cars. But given this great separated, elevated infrastructure that's connected, again, we were able to use the Greenway and Bryant. It was possible and it was magical. And when we went under the bridges on the Greenway, the kids were howling like wolves at the moon. And it just, <laughs> these things enable so much, basically. The, yeah. the infrastructure really enables a lot of community and a lot of joy. Yeah. Well, gosh, you know, this is, this is all sounding so incredible. Um, yeah, there we go. Another wonderful yeah, image. from the ride on yeah. the way to the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's still... our corner coffee store uh, right there. And it has a walk-up window. I guess that was probably from one of my posts. I didn't yeah. take the arrow off, but that's pointing to the walk-up window. Nice. I love it. I love it. That's so great. That is so great. So, again, Minneapolis. Rated one of the most bicycle friendly, active mobility friendly communities, you know, every year, year after year after year. This is just amazing looking at all these images. So, you know, clearly there's no real challenges. Oh, wait, I spoke too soon. <laughs> yep. And this this is why I'm constantly talking about the good and the bad, because, yes, being rated number one by people for bikes for biking in the U.S. sounds fantastic. But when you compare Minneapolis's infrastructure and our car dependency to other countries, like we have so far to go. Um, this is an example of my wife walking our eight year old to school in a like our neighborhood is quite walkable. We have, you know, you can see nice sidewalks and a, a boulevard between the sidewalk and the street. And I can't even tell you the number of times we're on our short five block walk or bike to school. We come across shrapnel from car crashes overnight or have close calls with drivers. And this one was pretty extreme because it was, it seemed like there was two cars maybe involved in the crash and one of them was just left on the sidewalk for us to walk by and the watch for children 10 mile per hour sign just felt really wild to see with the full scene all together. Good, good framing on this shot. I like that, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 I see the journalism, you know, training coming through. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, reflecting on what we have in screen here, we, we see that, again, watch for til children, 10 miles per hour is the sign, and yet the built environment says speed, speed, speed. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a yep. massively wide, over wide street. And I think this goes back to a, a very, very common thing that we all keep saying over and over and over again. It, that we can't just rely on um, enforcement. We can't rely on just, you know, saying, oh, well, let's re reduce the speed limits in the area. We actually have to, and we can't keep blaming. We can't blame 
the nut behind the wheel nor victim blame, we really need to work on changing the built environment, get the infrastructure right. Yep. Yeah. And, and Minneapolis as a city a couple years ago, three years ago, switched our speed limit citywide to 20 miles per hour unless posted otherwise. Of course, there are a number of streets that are posted otherwise, but the majority of like residential streets are 20 miles per hour. That's great, but without changing the actual street design, we are not actually seeing people suddenly lower their speed limit. And so this street is one that we have to walk along and actually is up for reconstruction, which I'm very excited to share all my opinions with the city about what we need to do to this one, which is just an overly wide two lane, two way road with street with parking on both sides. And it happens to be right off of a highway. So of course we have urban highways that just cut through our neighborhoods, destroying them, you know, decades ago and continue to cause harm to this day. And so I've noticed that the behavior of folks when they come on or off of the highway into my neighborhood is, is very different from folks who are just ride, you know, driving around the city. It's like, they've got that mentality of driving really, really fast. And then they're frustrated to suddenly have to go down to 20 or 30 miles per hour. And it causes a whole lot of problems. Well, I, I would say even right, rightfully so especially when the confusing message is as you come off of a go fast highway and then you get into a into a more residential and or commercial district and the roadway doesn't look that much different it's like yep i certainly don't blame the driver cuz i'm a driver too and it's like i'll get shocked frequently and be oh wait a minute no i'm transitioning into a different context and, and, and it's really important. I, I just posted a video last week. Was it last week or earlier this week? Earlier this week um, from Houghton. Today, we're, we're recording this on Friday the 13th. It's not scary. It's, it's not a scary day. I, I promise. Um, but yeah, earlier this week, I, I posted this video from Houghton in, in the Netherlands. And one of the things that Kylie, the, the resident, was talking about was how when they designed the community, they made sure that when people were coming in from the ring road into the community, they built up like uh, almost like ramparts and and like towers so that it was a gateway so that it was a sense sends a clear message that you are now entering into a different realm. You're no longer on the ring road. You're no longer on the highway. You're coming into an environment where there's an expectation that you're going to be driving 30 kilometers per hour or less. And you're going to have, you're going to be mixing and intermingling with people who are walking and biking because many of the streets are actually shared streets in that context. And so slow speeds are absolutely an imperative. Uh, plus, in that particular neighborhood, uh, there's no where, way to drive through the community. The only thing you can access is some local parking for residents and some local parking for people who are, are you know, wanting to get into the rest of the city and commercial districts. But there's no way to drive through. And so the entire community <laughs> acts as a, as a modal filter. <laughs> and, so, um, and so that's a great example of changing the context is like there's like this gateway, you're coming in, you're now in a different realm, slow down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we obviously have not done that in the U.S. for the most part. It's like you're on the highway and then suddenly you're in a neighborhood and the people who live and walk and bike through that neighborhood are just going to deal with all the consequences of the scary driving that to your point, understandably happens. Like that's something that I'm, I'm talking about regularly is I am, I own a car. I use a car when I need it. I also walk. I also bike. I also take transit. And I think our country's over-reliance and like just built environment that emphasizes the need to use a car forces people to think that you have to pick one mode when in a lot of circumstances you do have to pick a car because that's your only option but in so many situations you actually don't and so i i don't consider myself like a cyclist i'm just a person who bikes i'm a person who walks i'm a person who drives i'm a person who takes transit yeah yeah i'm glad you mentioned that too because i think that's one of the most important things for us to be able to have a significant impact on trying to transform our built environment, we don't get anywhere if we're just shouting at each other and and blaming the other side. Side, you know, it's like setting ourselves in camps and tribes and then warring the war on cars kind of thing. Um, and, and again, the war on cars, folks. That that name is tongue in cheek. It's 
it's not a war on cars. <laughs> if there's a war out there, it's mostly cars killing people, but we won't go there. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is the fact that, yeah, we're on, on any, any given day, we might be taking transit, we might be walking, we might be biking, we might need to drive. And so that's why it's so incredibly important to continue to grow uh, the tent and continue to educate and increase awareness because we've been, our minds have been so shaped by this concept that drive everywhere for everything all the time, um, which was perpetuated by motordom and motor normativity, car brain has kind of seeped in. And so we're trying to present a different way, present different opportunities and mobility choice. And that's where your nonprofit comes in that you're very much involved with. And so rstreetsmn.org, uh, I believe you are on the board, right? Yep. Yeah, yes. I'm the board president. Your board president. Talk a little bit about this organization and what you all are trying to do there. Um, and this is statewide or is this just Minneapolis? It used to be just Minneapolis, and we recently made the shift to be statewide. And it's it's really amazing because living in Minnesota and especially in the Twin Cities, we are so lucky to actually have a number of nonprofits focused on advocating for safe streets and land use and transportation and, and all the things. And so there are some really fantastic nonprofits um, that we share this space with. But our streets is near and dear to my heart. I've been lucky to be on the board for the last two years. And you can see there, um, our mission is really about transforming transportation in the Twin Cities. And we try to make it make uh, our streets places where people can easily and comfortably walk, bike, roll, and use public transit, just as we've been talking about. We previously also hosted the Open Streets events. We're currently in conversations with the city over a few things. So we did not host them this past year, but we hosted our own similar series called Imagine. And that's actually what what brought me into our streets is the, I mentioned we moved here the summer of 2019. And in September of 2019, there was an open streets on Nicolette, which is right like feet from my house. And so to be able to walk out of my home with, at the time I had a three-year-old and an almost one-year-old to experience the, Nicolette is one of the most highest injury streets in the city. And we had already experienced a lot of really scary behavior on the part of drivers running red lights not yielding when they take right on red. It's, it's pretty a scary street. And to experience that even just a few months after moving here, closed down to cars and opened up to people and seeing what my neighborhood was like, being able to walk in the street and feel safe was a game changer for me. And so I started thinking, okay, what is this our streets all about? I'd been involved in some advocacy in Denver, but um, I hadn't served on a board before, and so I was lucky enough to be able to join the board and our current initiatives, you know, going back to the conversation about urban highways, we have an opportunity right here in the Twin Cities around I-94, which is a major urban highway that, as all of them, for the most part in America, cut through cities and destroyed BIPOC and low-income communities um, with really lasting effects. And it's I-94 is up for reconstruction right now. And so we are really advocating for a change there to change it into an actual boulevard. Um, we also are working on an initiative called Bring Back Sixth, which we, similar idea there. It's a slightly smaller highway, but a, a highway that cut through a predominantly black and Jewish community. And we actually were recently awarded a really amazing Reconnecting Communities federal grant for that one, which is going to be a game changer for us to be able to have access to resources to really do our work. And then we also have municipal sidewalk plowing, which as I was speaking to earlier, is just such a challenge in the city that gets as much snow and ice as we do to rely on individual property owners to clear that space because they, for so many reasons, some of them are not able to, some of them can't, um, and then it impacts the mobility of, of everyone. And so I just feel so lucky to be able to work for a nonprofit that does the work in the way that our streets does, which is really having a focus on centering the voices of the communities that are most impacted um, by our historical and our current choices around uh, transportation and infrastructure and really amplifying the, the effects of systemic racism and classism and the ways that the systems continue to make life really hard for so many folks. And so 
it's, it's an incredible organization. I encourage everyone to check out our website and donate if you if you have the ability to or volunteer if you're local to the Twin Cities or Minnesota. Yeah, and that's what we're looking at right now here, folks, is our streets mn.org. I'll have that link uh, in the show notes uh, for you as well. I, I love this shot here with the, the roller skater. This totally brings back memories uh, for uh, one of the Open Streets events that I was able to attend probably back in... Oh, gosh, it must have been 11 years ago, like 2013. Uh, so those those events had been around for a long time. Uh, very, very successful. As I understood, they would rotate around to different neighborhoods and different groups and, and focus in on different streets. Is that kind of the approach to, to the way Minneapolis had done that in the past? Yeah, for sure. And in recent years, we really tried to focus on streets that had opportunities for reconstruction coming up so that it could be a double duty of giving folks the opportunity to experience that street without cars and then also giving them an opportunity to learn more about the reconstruction project and to weigh in and give feedback um, to the city or county or whoever was responsible for the reconstruction. And I think that's part of what what's so unique about the way that our streets does our work is in addition to the events that we hold and the, and the typical advocacy work that we do, we actually have a team of on staff paid canvassers who are out knocking doors to share information, to get feedback from the, from the communities that are impacted by these projects. And we're especially doing that for the Twin Cities Boulevard and just noticing even years into this project, how much the Department of Transportation hasn't yet reached. You know, the, the MnDOT is working to do their own outreach, but they haven't reached folks. The average person who lives in these communities actually doesn't even know that this project is ongoing and has a lot of thoughts. And we need to be centering their voices and their values and their perspectives the most because they have been and will continue to be the most impacted by whatever we choose to do with these projects. Um, but our hope at our streets is that whether we end up doing the city contract through open streets or our own events, we would love, we think every neighborhood in the city deserves to have an open street style event. So we have about 13 wards throughout the city and the dream would be to have an open street style event in each of the 13 wards. We just had one in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood uh, a weekend a week or two ago. And it was incredible. Like our staff are so good at, at making sure that the events are not just closed down the street. It is closed down the street to cars and in, infuse the local communities, everything into it. And so in that community, we had the Wienery is a hot dog restaurant that is really well known and beloved there. And they had a wiener dog race, actual dogs, like pet dogs were racing outside of the wienery to see which dog was the fastest. We had camel rides, we had cardboard fights, like kids dressed up in cardboard and making little swords and, and battling each other. It just was so joyful and, and wonderful. Yeah. I, I, I love it when there's, you see the dachshund races. That's great. The wiener dogs. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And we bent the rules a little bit. Pretty much if the dog was small enough, they got to race. So yeah, we did yeah, have yeah. some actual dogs. Yeah, yeah. Definitely not dachshunds, but it was, it was also cute. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I love about Open Streets events and uh, events it, that take place out in, in our streets is, you know, it, it brings up in my coffee mug here in the de declarative statement of streets are for people. And that's part of that, that challenge that we have is to like reframe, well, what are our streets for? And, and again, we had mentioned earlier the car brain, the motor normativity, you know, kind of thinking that, oh, no, streets are only for driving and for driving as fast as possible. And that's not what streets are for. You know, streets have been around literally for thousands of years, and the automobile is the new interloper uh, into that environment. It really is the platform for coming together, socialization, platform for building wealth, and so I love these events because of what you had just said. It helps reinforce and reframe how people are relating to the streets. And you said something there as well about um, targeting streets that are up for redo and, you know, rebuilding and re reimagining what they can be. And I do remember back to that Open Streets event that I attended back in 2013, where uh, there was actually a demonstration of 
this is what a protected bike lane was. And so uh, there was there was a, a protected bike lane that had been set up, you know, as, as everybody was milling around. They did it with uh, with very nicely done with flower pots, you know, very similar to like like the rectangular ones and, and high. It was like, you know, a significant sort of approach similar to the, the, the self-watering uh, protected planter boxes that cities actually use. It wasn't that, but I think it was like constructed like it. it I think as, as memory serves, it might have even been constructed out of wood to look like and feel like what a, a planter protected bike lane would look like. And, uh, and so folks would be able to roll through or stroll through if they wanted to, if they didn't, weren't on roller skates or a bike or a scooter, uh, but they would, you know, go through, you know, there was a volunteer at the one end to, to say, oh yeah, this, this is what this is. There's information that they could hand over to them, a leaflet about the, the prospect of doing a protected cycling infrastructure, either on that street or in that neighborhood. Um, I can't remember which. And then there was another volunteer at the other end to do sort of a debrief. What did you think? You know, wh- wh- what was that experience like? Could you see yourself being, you know, comfortable in this type of environment if this were to come to your neighborhood? And I love that because when we talk it with, as advocates, when we talk about these things in sort of like these high level stuff and we throw, throw terminology out like protected bike lanes and separated infrastructure and all that, the, the average person is just like, what the heck are you talking about? But when you can see it and feel it and ride down it, roll down it, it really helps open the eyes of the community at large because they're not eating, drinking, believing, and breathing this stuff the way we are. That is part of why I have found it so valuable to share photos and videos of the things that I'm talking about because I think so many folks just don't have a concept for what this infrastructure looks like and what it might feel like. And I have shared a number of photos and videos of Bryant Avenue. There was a number of the photos that we looked at that were of that street. And almost since it was constructed, it it finished last fall. So it's almost a year old now. Almost every time I'm on that street, which is every day, I hear someone either walking or biking by clearly giving a tour of Bryant Avenue to a friend, a family member, someone visiting, whatever. Um, or someone who just is there for the first time and commenting on like, whoa, look at that bike lane. I've never seen anything like that. That's so cool. Look at, look at whatever. And the things that can happen on streets that are redesigned to actually be for everyone and not just cars are really incredible. Like I just was on Bryant, I think two nights ago, going past the senior living facility. And there was a parent and a, a parent on a bike, a kid on a scooter, Uh, an adult like senior on a motorized wheelchair and they were headed towards a corner store and I watched them ahead of me stopping to talk to each other. I don't know what the guy was saying to the, the parent and the kid, but they were having a very friendly chat. And then the mom and the kid went into their apartment and the guy on the motorized wheelchair continued down the street. He crossed the street, got to the corner store and two teenage boys on skateboards stopped and opened the door to the corner store so that he could get in easily. And he had a chat with them. And I'm just like, these interactions seem so small and so insignificant, but they build up to make people feel really part of a community and to feel like the streets are actually used to support that community and not exclusively for cars to move through as quickly as possible. And it, it just is really powerful. Yeah. To close this out, I wanted to go back to this photo and and say kind of my last word, but then give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, to address anything that we haven't already talked about. And you had mentioned that, you know, this is your daughter riding up ahead of you, um, uh, about eight years old or so down Bryant. You mentioned that this was probably like an 11 or 12 year old, you know, boy coming the, I think it's a boy uh, coming the child coming the other way. And the point I wanted to make about this is yes, not only is all ages and abilities infrastructure 
makes it super, super empowering for, um, you know, the folks that we had just mentioned, you know, the people in the mobility devices, the all ability side. But again, emphasis on the all ages for young and old being able to be able to have the freedom of mobility. And one of the things that I'm very, very passionate about, and I'm sure you are as a parent, is that you're able to have a situation so that you can have kids that develop, have the ability as a 12 year old to be able to go out on a ride for themselves, be able to do something. Uh, I had Lenore Skenazy on recently, the author of the book Free Range Kids, and we talked about how empowering it is to have an environment like the Dutch have where, you know, kids from very young age can get themselves to where they need to get to under their own power. Talk a little bit about that. Address, you know, from a parent's perspective, how empowering and powerful that is, you know, for you guys to, you know, have this network being built out and coming together. I know it's not there yet completely, but it's making progress. It's an incredible quality of life factor for my family. And it's a huge reason why we've chosen to live in the neighborhood we live in and in a city. I grew up in the suburbs where I did not have this. I, the nearest transit stop was three miles away I could bike to two friends' houses who were in my neighborhood, but everything else was separated by highways or high-speed unsafe streets. And so I relied on my parents to drive me anywhere. Anytime I wanted to go anywhere, they had to drive me. And I actually worked in high school a part-time job just so that I could pay for my car so that I could go hang out with my friends who many of them, due to zoning for schools, lived eight miles away. So I didn't have any other way to see them. And so to be able to raise my kids in an environment where they won't have to have a part-time job to go see their friends. They have transit all around us. They have bike infrastructure all around us. And we have the density support to support walkability so that they can, like, before we don't have an ingredient, I can send them down to the co-op, not yet, but in a couple of years, I can send them walking by themselves down to the co-op to grab whatever we need for dinner. And that just is an incredible quality of life gift. And I share about that a lot. One morning I was actually out for a walk after I dropped my own kids off and I started taking photos of all the cargo bikes that I saw. And then I realized that I just was live tweeting cargo bikes and it got to like 12 different cargo bikes that I'd seen and kids on their own bikes. And I, it's just incredible to see. And there are groups of like 12 to 16 year olds that I'll see in little herds, you know, biking together with their friends. And it's, that's what we should all want for our kids is to have that ability, obviously age appropriate and all the things. But if the infrastructure supports it and the parents and the kids decide that it feels safe, like that's what we should all want for our communities and our families. Yeah. Is there anything that we haven't yet talked about that you want to make sure to leave the audience with? I think we covered everything. That was a lovely conversation. Yeah. No, it's it, it. I and and again, I want to reemphasize that uh, you know, for folks, if you are out there in social media, um, uh, again, my my platform of choice these days is now um, obviously YouTube, where I'm producing all this content. But um, on social media, I'm out on uh, threads all the time. Laura, you do such a great job of sharing what you're seeing out there. And I remember when you you posted that about the uh, all the different. Oh, there's- yeah. Yeah. There's the little herds of kids. There's the herds of bikes. kids. Yeah. <laughs> you do such a great job of, 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 of capturing and sharing this and very much in the same genre of um, my good friend, Brandon uh, Lust, uh, American Feetzer, of capturing the mundane, the normal stuff that happens the day in and day out. And these images of, you know, this is what it's like when you, you you have an environment where we can have free range kids. And, you know, Brandon likes to, to emphasize that this is powerful because you have no idea how many lives that you're touching. Very few people who actually see the content out in social media actually engage with it and, and comment and like. But they're, they're getting exposed to it and you just never know when you're influencing and impacting uh, somebody. I hear people, you know, people will come up to me all the time. I'll be on an airplane going somewhere and they'll be like, is that you, John? And they, they recognize my voice from the podcast or, they, or my face from YouTube. And, and they're like, thank you for doing what you're doing. I really appreciate it. I'll introduce myself. They'll introduce themselves. It'll be somebody I've never heard of. They've never interacted with me on social media or online. 
but it's a good reminder that we're making an impact by at least broadcasting out. So thank you for doing that. I hope you have that those wonderful opportunities too to hear back from some of your audience that's out there. I actually, I was on a bicycle ride recently. Bicycle is a local group that hosts a lot of rides for all ages and abilities, but we do get a lot of families with young kids and had a parent come up to me and say that seeing the things that I post online helped them have the courage to start biking with their young kids. And I was like, that is the best thing, that, that's the best compliment anyone can give me that I inspired at least one person to get out there and start riding and find the joy in it. So it's, it's such a privilege to be able to share things with others and I have so much fun with it. Yay. Well, and I had so much fun doing this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura, for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure and uh, can't wait to make my trip up to uh, Minneapolis to, to meet you in person at some point in time. Yes. Love that. Please do. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Laura Mitchell. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and remember to ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming a Patreon member. Patrons do get access to all my content early and ad free and get an additional benefit of 15% off in the Active Town Store. And speaking of the Active Town Store, pop on over to get your own Streets Are For People mug, <laughs> t-shirts, as well as water bottles, and uh, oh, and got a brand new Active Towns embroidered hat out there as well for you. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.